Good morning. It's good to be back. It's good to be away, but it is good to have family to come home to and a community to come home to and to be with. I don't know, maybe you just came this morning for the food. <laughs> but that's okay too, because I'm just, I'm just glad you're here. I'm glad we can be together. And as we dig into these passages this morning, let's just start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it is just so good to be together this morning as your family. You have called us to be the church in this world, to be your church as your children. And Lord, as we dig into your word this morning, we just pray that your spirit would open our hearts and minds, that Lord, you would just challenge us, that we would see you, and that Lord, as we go, it would make a difference. This we pray in your name, amen. So welcome to September. It is, as Susie said, for a lot of people, uh, it is a new start. Kids are back to school. Some parents are very happy. Some parents struggle with it as, you know, maybe the firstborn is going to school and they miss having them around. It's a big it's a big change. Or maybe it's your last one going off to school and now the house is empty during the day and you wonder what you're going to do with yourself. But either way, there is something about September where we kind of settle into a rhythm. The summer is almost over, even though if you look at the weather forecast, the temperatures this week don't show that, which is awesome. But there is something now about, we kind of feel like we need to settle into a rhythm for the next months. And that's okay. We do it as a church too. Part of our weekly rhythm is gathering here. And you know, over the next number of weeks, next couple months, we are really going to dive into what it means to be the church. We're really going to get in and pull this apart. And what does that mean in today's world? The world that we live in. So, the sermon title for this morning is maybe a little confusing. Why Jesus wants us to stop going to church. And really, over the course of this message, my aim is to convince you all to not go to church again. So if this place is empty next week, I was successful. No, not quite. Not quite. But you know, we live in a world today, a world in the West, where it really, these are tumultuous times to be the church and to be a Christian. You know, it's, not, it's not that anybody is overly, overtly persecuting us. Nobody says that we can't gather. Nobody is putting us at gunpoint if we confess that we are a Christian. But it's happening in a lot more subtle ways. We're just simply discounted now. We live in a world now where the church of Christ is no longer seen as relevant. The church no longer seems to get a say at the table. In fact, we don't even get invited to the table to have a say anymore. Young people today, millennials are very disillusioned with organized church. You know, over the last number of years, we've seen some of the largest 
and the most visible churches in North America just simply implode as their leaders have committed moral failure. There has sadly been an epidemic of sexual abuse in the church. It seems to get lots of time in the media. Unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church has been named a lot, but it hasn't been limited to just the Roman Catholic Church. But it is something that people go, they know better. Why would I want to be a part of that? A number of years ago, we saw in the U.S., seemingly overnight, as protests and people gathered all over the U.S. in response to police brutality against black people and against the racist systems of power that allowed these injustices to go unchecked. Where was the voice of the church in all of that? The church was simply invisible. And you don't have to look far now into the political situation in the U.S. You look at how many evangelical churches have aligned themselves with Donald Trump and his party A man who is known to have no morals. He says he goes to church, but his life certainly and the way that he treats people shows that it's not something that even crosses his mind. And people ask themselves, really? How can you be a Christian and support a man like that. We're not relevant anymore. And since, especially since COVID, there have been a lot of people who have sent that message to the church by walking away with their feet. I was again reminded last week as I was on holidays and we were in Quebec and every town we come to you could see the church steeple from a distance it was once a province where 90% of the province went to church every Sunday those churches now sit empty and in decline David Fitch, in his book, What is the Church, says this, and I think that this quote is very relevant for today. He says, the sun is setting on Christendom in the West, and churches everywhere are facing disruption and decline. It's true. But I want to dive this morning into a little bit. So what is the church? What is the church? Because I think this is something that is very important for us to understand. And I brought some tools this morning to demonstrate. So this is question and answer session. What's this? There's one in every crowd, eh? Hammer is correct. But it doesn't work so good if you try to use it as a pair of pliers, does it? And it's the same for this. We have a saw and we have a screwdriver. But if you try to use this as a hammer or this as a screwdriver, it doesn't work so well. You see, it's important that things are used for their intended purpose. But it's also our language and how we talk about things is very important. Have you ever noticed how often we use the phrase, I'm going to church this morning? 
or let's meet at church. Or your neighbor asks you on a Sunday morning, where are you going? You say, oh, I'm going to church. Or you might say to somebody, oh, I'll see you next Sunday at church. Really? How does that work? See, you can't go to church. You can't. It's physically impossible because the church is not a building. The church is the people. And you know, when we say things like we're going to church, it's really, really bad theology. It gets at the heart of our identity. The church is us. The church is the body of believers. Neville read for us in Romans 16, 5, where Paul says, greet also the church that meets at their house. He didn't call the house the church. He didn't say, greet the people that meet at that church. No, he said, greet the church. The church is the people of God who are called together to be the church. And you know, you might be sitting there thinking, I'll say, it's not really a big deal. It's just semantics. It's just a phrase we use. But it really is. It is a big deal. When you define a people group as a building, or a network of buildings. You know, we don't do that with a family. We don't do that in a job. We don't do that in any other relationships. If you are part of a bowling team here in Stratford, you don't call your bowling team the Mike's Bowling Lanes. It's not something we do. But for some reason, we do it with the church. But you know, and here's the sad part. For too many Christians, though, they just go to church. It becomes that box that they tick off on the list of weekly things that they have to do. And as a society, we equate being a Christian with going to church. There's an assumption, oh, they must be a Christian. They go to church on Sundays. But you know, there are people who go to church their whole lives and never accept Christ. But we assume that they're Christians because they go to church. A friend of mine told a story of being with his grandfather as his grandfather was on his deathbed and he asked his grandfather, was he scared of death? And his grandfather said, I am terrified. Which caught him as a surprise because his grandfather had gone to church his whole life. And on his deathbed, his grandfather admitted to his grandson that even though he had gone to church his whole life, he had never accepted Jesus Christ. So he said, yes, I am terrified because I don't know where I'm going. I grew up going to church. Sunday mornings, my mom would often say, okay, kids, get dressed, it's time to go to church. But you see, the problem is that when we use bad semantics and bad theology, it creeps into other areas of our life. It's not just about going to church. But, you know, we do things here like when somebody says to me, what's the worship like in your church? What are they talking about? Singing. 
or somebody says, I don't like the worship in my church, they're saying, I don't like the songs we sing. Well, when did worship become about singing songs on a Sunday morning as we sit in rows? We call this a worship service. But you know, it's not a worship service. This is a time when we gather as God's people to be in His presence. But worship is something that we do every day of the week. We don't just do it on a Sunday morning. But yet that's the language we use. We don't leave a Sunday morning and say, oh, you're going to worship now for the rest of the day. No, we talk about, we'll see you worship next Sunday. But all of life is worship. When we start to define these things in a way that they were never meant to be defined, it becomes so easy for us to segregate our lives. We go to church on a Sunday morning to worship, but once we leave, the rest of the week is our own. That's not how we are created. And when we come to church, we start to set rules for going to church because going to church becomes a special event where things that are acceptable in our day-to-day -day lives as we live are not acceptable in church. But you know, anything that we do during the week as we worship should be acceptable in church on a Sunday morning. There is no difference in how we are called to live. But we do that. We become preoccupied with things like, what do people wear to church? How do they style their hair in church? What kind of songs do we sing? What is acceptable behavior in church? We have it wrong. Our identity. Each person that sits here this morning, your identity is that you are the church. The church is people. It always has been people, and it always will be people. It's not a building. It's not something that you do on a Sunday morning. You are the church. You are a child of the Almighty, and all of our life is worship of the Most High. It always has been, and it always will be. There should be no difference between how you act here on a Sunday morning and how you act when you leave those doors. All of life is worship. Any behaviors that we consider acceptable in our homes, in the marketplace, on the schoolyard, when we gather as a family, should all be acceptable here. I'm thinking about the names that the Van Royen kids would call each other at home should be acceptable here on a Sunday morning, right? Sorry, they keep me entertained during the service, so sometimes I just have to call them out. <laughs> and I'm so glad they're here. They're really, they're great people. So, any language that we use during the week is acceptable here. You know, when we start to call this building the church and this service worship, we create divisions in our life that aren't healthy. When we come on Sunday mornings, we gather as the church, not in the church. We gather in a building. 
a building that exists for the purpose of us living out our ministry that God has given us. It serves our mission. We are God's family that gathers as a family. Yes, we do worship, but this is not a worship service. Worship is something that we do in every part of our life all week long. Can we worship here? Absolutely. Because we do it all week, so we naturally do it here. He says we naturally do it all week. And as the church, we can't go to church. And if you read scripture, you're never going to find a spot where Jesus mandated us to go to church and sit in rows on a Sunday morning and check out the hair or lack of it on the head in front of us. Thanks for coming. And you have hair. You're lucky. <laughs> but that's what we do. And for so many people, that's all they do. That's all they do. And they check off that box. I went to church. I'm done. See you next Sunday. You know, the truth is we're family. God's family. We are his children. We are the church. And we serve together as a family. There's no volunteers here. We often say, oh, somebody's volunteering for this. They're volunteering for that. They're volunteering to do this in the church. No, no, no. There's no volunteers. How can there be volunteers when we're family? You don't volunteer at home to do things as a family member. No, you do it because you're a member of that family. Because you belong. Because you love the other members of your family and you have a desire to spend time with them. And when we call people volunteers, we create this artificial designation that degrades them. It just doesn't apply. See, we're family members. We care for each other. We love each other. We hold each other up. We serve together with the responsibility of being members of a family. For those of you who are parents, how much time in a week do you put into being a parent? You see, you're always a parent. You don't get to turn it on and off as you want. Once a parent, always a parent. Even as your kids move out of the house, well, sometimes they come back. Um, but you never stop being a parent. And it's true when you are a part of God's family. You don't get to turn it on and off as you wish. When you accept Christ into your life and you become a child of God, you are now a part of his family no matter where you are or what you're doing. Think of that the next time you're out with a bunch of your friends having a few drinks. Or you're sitting at your computer late at night by yourself and you're feeling lonely. You are still a child of God, you are still a part of his family. You don't get to turn that off. It's always there. So now that we've defined the church, the church is a body of believers. We're not going to refer to this building as the church anymore. We're not going to say we go to church. We're going to say we're going to be with our family. We're going to be with a missional community. And here we tie into 
what Neville read to us out of Matthew 28, where Jesus gave his mission to the church. And this is the only thing that matters to the church. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So this isn't something he just pulled out of his back pocket that day. He did this as our Savior. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and I am passing this to you, and I am instructing you to go to all people in all nations, baptizing and teaching them as I have taught you. You see, Jesus modeled what he wanted done. He modeled discipleship. He lived with his disciples for three years. He did life with them. He didn't put them through, you know, a three-hour course for 12 weeks, and now you've got this. He didn't say, well, come gather with me at the temple for an hour and a half every Sunday morning, and we'll talk about a few things, and then you can go again. It was an all-in lifestyle. He lived with them for three years, and he taught them, and he mentored with them. He showed them by walking the walk with them. This is the mission that Christ gave to us as the church. He said, go. Don't huddle in here on a Sunday morning by yourself and protect yourself and segregate yourself from the rest of the world. He said, go. I talked earlier about how the church has become kind of invisible in today's society. I really think that's because a lot of churches have lost that. They don't go anymore. They do church on a Sunday morning. We talk about discipleship as a concept, not a lifestyle. See, there's a lot of things in the church that have changed from the early churches of the day, the early gatherings, where they sought to live out what they believed. Today, we seem to have lots of things that we believe in, but we don't live out. And how are we going to change that? Over the next seven weeks, we are going to explore that in depth. What does it mean for us to live out this mission of discipleship. See, each and every one of us gathered here this morning, you are disciples. You are disciples, and more than that, you are called to be a disciple maker. So one of the questions I like to ask people is, how many people in your life do you have that you are discipling? When you look at your friend group, the people that you hang out with, the people that you associate and do life with, how many of them are you discipling? How many of them don't even know Christ? We love to surround ourselves with people who are like us. We love to surround ourselves with other Christians and do life in a bubble, but that's not what Christ called us to. when I was in ministry the first time, one of the realizations that I had later on was I had no friends, no acquaintances, really, at that point in my life who didn't know Jesus Christ. Everybody was a Christian. I lived in that Christian bubble. Today, the majority of my friends are non-Christians. 
And I love it. I really love it. There are three things that I want you to really think about today as we go from here and we continue this and we continue to dive into what does it mean to be the church? To be the church, not go to church. First thing is this. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we might start going to church once in a while on Sundays. That was never his mission. That was never his intent. I'm not sure if this is true, but it made me think in discussions around this concept, somebody said to me, when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing, was he talking about the people who had just crucified him? Or was he talking about what his church would become? A group of people who don't live out the mission that he's given us. But when Jesus died on the cross, he came to save us. And he came to give us truly abundant lives on this side of heaven. That is what he died for. Jesus' command to his disciples, this is the second thing, Jesus' command to his disciples just before he ascended into heaven was not invite people to your church or plant great churches. It was to make disciples. To make disciples. So how is your life radically centered around making disciples? How are you being discipled? How are you discipling other people. If you, and the third thing, if you are a Christian, then you are the church. It's an identity thing. It's not a building thing. It's an identity thing. It's true of you, and your mission is to be and to make disciples. You are are a family of missionary servants who is sent. Sometimes the church has been very good at saying, well, look at that wall of pictures out there. That's, that's our missionaries. Those are the ones who are sent. They're the ones that go and do the missionary work. We've delegated it. We are a missional community. We are a missional family who is called to go. Nobody ever gave us permission to delegate that to a few. But we are all called to walk that walk. I pray that you start to wrestle with these questions in this coming week. Looking at what God is calling you to asking yourself, where does this go in your life? How do we become obedient so that all of our life is centered around this call to be a disciple and to make disciples? Amen.